All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, having me today. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, my name is Pierre-Yves Richard. I'm co-founder and CTO of a company uh, called Exoscale. Uh, we sell infrastructure as a service uh, in Switzerland. Uh, and we try to make it simple for um, people who want to focus on uh, developing their apps and not infrastructure. I'm also an open source developer. Uh, I'm here today in my quality as uh, one of uh, Riemann's maintainers. Uh, I also work on other uh, projects that um, revolve around monitoring uh, and um, system collection. And I used to be a, a member of the OpenBSD team, amongst uh, other things. Um, today, I want to talk about um, a few things. Um, the, the theory and the founding principles around Riemann, why uh, I think people uh, need something like Riemann uh, in the first place. Um, a bit of an introduction to the project for those case and how uh, I think we came up with a programming UI uh, for um, a system infrastructure that uh, works well. Uh, and then uh, since we're at a functional programming conference, we can uh, look a little bit at how functional programming can help build good programming UI. So as far as the founding principles go, um, Riemann is a tool that addresses uh, what we usually call the ops team, uh, right? People who deal with the infrastructure uh, and who watch over it. Um, and I think that for these teams, um, the, the important things are to have uh, quiet days, days where they, they can focus on higher order abstraction for their uh, platform and infrastructure, think about hard problems, uh, silent nights, of course, where the pager doesn't uh, uh, come off every five minutes, uh, and which usually drives you crazy. Um, for this, you need to have better insight into what uh, you're watching on. Uh, and you need to have the ability to make informed decisions. Uh, if you don't have this insight and this uh, capacity to make informed decisions, you usually fall into um, uh, an attitude where uh, you have a fear of change on infrastructure because you want to leave things as they are. Um, and I'll make a, a small tangent and talk about uh, a scientist and a philosopher uh, that was called uh, uh, Alfred Korzybski. Um, who remarked that, um, and who had a theory uh, about map and territory, uh, he remarked that when we look at the world and when we think about the world, we tend uh, to build a model, a mental model for the, the things we think about. And we have this tendency to confuse our mental model for uh, reality itself, right? We, we tend to confuse the model and the thing, um, and he explained, uh, the way he showed this is by saying that we often confuse maps for territories. Uh, and I bring that up because I think that in our uh, daily job as computer scientists, as software developers, as platform engineers, uh, we work in the abstract, right? We work on things that we can't really touch. So uh, mental models for us, they're even more important. Uh, and it's much easier for us to confuse our mental models with reality. And I'll give you two small examples, right? Um, as software developers, um, you work on rather large code bases, and you have this map for uh, your code base in your mind. Um, and for some changes, you might think, well, this one's going to be easy. I know that part very well. I can just make this quick change without unit tests or uh, um, thinking it through. And then you end up with this, right? Um, or as network engineers, uh, you might think that you have this really good notion of uh, how everything is mapped in your head on the network, and you can just add this um, a static route really quick, which won't change much, but uh, is a nice optimization, and you end with uh, a network that's not working anymore. So th that's what I, I mean when I say that uh, we need to make informed decisions. Um, we, we need to make decisions based on facts, numbers, and hopefully visualizations. Um, basically, you need to have a better map for your territory, right? You, you can't really do away with the map. You will always be working with our own mental models, uh, but they need to be as close as possible to reality, and um, we need to have supporting facts uh, for the maps. I think it's interesting to, to talk about this today because the systems that we build are increasingly complex. Uh, if you look at software, uh, especially software that targets the web, as I'll talk 
about um, that we used to build and the, the systems we build now, they tend to spend much, much more machines. Uh, they tend to be inherently more complex. Uh, but we're still mostly looking at the same things to assess if the things we build work or not. Um, and again, uh, I think a, a good example is the web industry. Um, if you look at m most websites uh, as they were in the early 2000s, um, even for a very popular website, it was quite feasible to run on one or two servers. You had your Apache and PHP server that uh, did the d small dynamic bits, uh, and your uh, SQL server that held the data uh, for the dynamic bits. And that was about it. Right? So for visibility, you could rely on very few things. Uh, MRTG, Cacti, uh, back in the day, uh, maybe look at some logs. Um, very you know, basic tooling, but that worked for a, a simple infrastructure like this. Um, and if you look at the landscape today, we build these systems that are um, crazy complex. Most people now uh, work on web applications that actually drive revenue. Um, and we actually call them web applications now. They do much more than just display uh, content. So you might have your load balancing tier. Uh, you might have your uh, uh, application server tier with Nginx and also your um, actual application server on the GVM, on Ruby on Rails, on whatever. Uh, a queuing tier with RabbitMQ or something else. Uh, caching uh, to improve um, page speed. Still a, a SQL database, but uh, there might be many slaves for that uh, database, or it, it can be partitioned across several instances. And you might even have um, other database type, uh, technology to uh, service other needs. Um, but the key thing here is that um, for most people, visibility still looks like this. Uh, you're still looking at uh, CPU metrics, uh, memory usage, and that's about it. And getting uh, useful information out of that is really hard. Um, basically, you can't be answering how is business doing today? Are we driving revenue with uh, our web application by you know CPUs at 60%? That's that's not a real answer to to the question. The the idea would be to to answer that question with you know based on the key metrics, uh, uh, number of sessions, uh, number of transactions, uh, and actual um, payment amounts. We're, we're doing good. So if you look at what we do, um, that, that's uh, our service. We, we basically allow you to spin up VMs very, very fast, to interact with us through tickets, and to do object storage. Um, we, we have a large uh, distributed system, right? Um, to service both of these needs, we have a, a control plane and then an agent that spans on hypervisors, on storage nodes. We also run a lot of our own workloads uh, on Exascale itself, um, which means that you know, we have all these uh, services. Uh, I tend to avoid the, the microservice term, but uh, we have uh, services of uh, all sorts. Um, and we need to watch over them since we run plenty of those on VMs. Um, VMs might come and go, so we have uh, high volatility in, uh, in nodes and we have to account for that. So for us, um, traditional metrics don't, don't, don't work, right? If we, high, if we have high CPU utilization, that means we, we utilize our resources correctly. Uh, and uh, we don't buy hardware for nothing, which is uh, basically how, how we make money. Um, so the, the same goes for, uh, for memory. Um, so we need to look at uh, how much we're uh, billing per hour um, if API requests are uh, serviced correctly. This is the type of things that we're really interested in looking at and, and having a way to, to detect spikes or very early. So when we started looking at how we would um, uh, monitor our, the, the systems we were building back in 2012, uh, our shopping list uh, looked like this. Uh, we wanted something that was passive, uh, meaning that didn't need to take account uh, to have a list of machines that it should uh, watch over, but rather listen for uh, events as they came in. Uh, we wanted something that allowed us to work on windows of events over time, uh, meaning uh, to 
take decisions such as there is a spike in uh, 400 uh, class errors on uh, that API um, uh, serving tier. Uh, this is the, the type of things we wanted to do and we wanted also the capacity of combining system metric and in-application metrics uh, to provide higher order type um, metrics. And basically, that's what um, Riemann promised to do back at the time, uh, even though it was uh, in its infancy. Um, Riemann is, uh, can be found at that website now, uh, and this GitHub um, uh, project. Um, it's a distributed um, system monitoring engine. Uh, it was built specifically for this task, uh, and it provides you with a unified language for dealing with events, right? Uh, it's now one of uh, the, the successful uh, closure projects. Uh, as, um, as a side note, uh, I think we have uh, three, over 3,000 3, stars or something. It's, it's, uh, it's not a huge project, but it's, uh, it's a project that has attracted a bit of traction in the, um, in the closure ecosystem and, and beyond. Um, as you'll see, to functional programmers, uh, Riemann doesn't bring anything groundbreakingly new to the table, right? It's pretty much um, all concepts, but presented in a programming UI that I think uh, makes it palatable for uh, operations teams. Uh, since, I mean, its key audience is different than uh, the usual uh, functional programming audience, it's um, uh, infrastructure teams. So the general idea uh, behind Riemann is that you have uh, a lot a lot of capacity to input events. Uh, they get normalized to a unique form. Uh, there's a, a stream processing engine at its core that's able to take decisions, uh, and it has output support to uh, either uh, persist uh, metrics to graphite, uh, to send alerts uh, through email or pager, pager duty, uh, any, any type of uh, output, really. And it also provides a visualization engine to inspect uh, its internal state uh, and draw graphs. So if you look at it, it sounds like a typical uh, stream processing engine. We'll see a bit later on how it differs from more traditional stream proce processing engines. I was talking about a unified language, uh, and this form is really what Riemann normalizes any of its inputs to. Uh, it, it builds a map uh, that uses a host and service key as the identity of the event, and that's how they're, um, they differentiate from, uh, from each other. And these events may have any other uh, attributes, but the standard ones are uh, a state, uh, is the event uh, uh, representing something that's okay, uh, where there's a warning or something that's critical. Uh, most of the time there's a metric uh, attached to the event, uh, you might have tags to classify them a bit more uh, easily. Uh, time to live, which means uh, for how long that event uh, is supposed to live in the system. Um, and yeah, that's and the time at which the, the event happened. To send data to Riemann from any application, uh, you can use uh, any language you want, really. Uh, I'm not sure there are uh, platforms that are not able to, to send to Riemann, uh, mostly thanks to the uh, the C and C++ uh, support for it. Um, here uh, you have a small example on, on how to do that in Clojure. Uh, it also works on the JVM, on Golang, Python, Ruby, and, and whatnot. In terms of data emission, um, apart from sending um, events from within your application, uh, there are also plenty of uh, software out there that know how to send natively um, data to Riemann. Uh, CollectD and Snap Telemetry are uh, system metric collection agents, uh, which tell you the standard things that live on a system, but can also go down and look at, you know, is your database correctly replicated, um, or things like this. Um, SyslogNG allows you to, you know, say whenever there's a log message that matches that pattern, or that's, um, or whose level is uh, critical, uh, then send out to to Riemann. Um, Nagios is also able to forward uh, some things to, to Riemann, and there's also, of course, native uh, transport available. As far as output is concerned, I'll, I won't spend too much on it, but you have persistence options. Uh, for instance, if you want to uh, historize your metrics in, uh, in Graphite, in Librato, 
Um, it's, it's able to send out emails to forward to other Riemann servers. Uh, and you can even um, notify people on the IRC, Slack, or, or other types of services like this. And last, as, as far as visualization is concerned, uh, let's say that our strong suit isn't uh, front-end development, but uh, you, you have this capacity of, of building dashboards, named dashboards that look at you know, one part of uh, your infrastructure uh, and show graphs. We see most people uh, using um, the graphite output and Grafana support uh, to build visualizations also. Uh, that's a very uh, common approach, uh, approach now. So to sum up, um, Riemann is a problem domain specific stream processing engine. Uh, it has a, a fast asynchronous uh, uh, network protocol as its core, uh, an in-memory store for events, uh, and a DSL that lets you, you know, work with your events. Since plenty of you know, know the JVM, most of you know, what, uh, make Freeman, uh, what makes Freeman fast is Netty and Protobufs. Um, we, we have uh, Netty servers uh, through TCP, TLS, or UDP uh, that are able to receive batches of events that are encoded in Protobuf, and that's how we reach you know, a, a upwards of a million events per second on uh, uh, simple VMs. Uh, so, uh, you know, we can't take much credit for it, uh, really. Um, the event store also relies on the technology we didn't build, which is uh, a log-free concurrent uh, hash map on the JVM written in, in Java, um, and which is really efficient, also completely uh, freight service since, since uh, concurrent and uh, log-free, so it works very well with um, Netty. And it's purely in memory. We don't, uh, we don't persist events. Uh, as as far as the DSL in is concerned, what you're uh, um, given as a consumer or a user of Riemann is Clojure. Uh, you write your configuration file in uh, Clojure itself. It's an internal DSL. Uh, but you have a lot of um, facility functions to work with events, to set up inputs, to do generatorial uh, type of um, uh, things, and then to also set up outputs. Uh, we also have a plugin system which allows you to build um, functionality for your uh, your own third integrate third party integration and uh, plug it in so if if you look at it from the perspective of uh, it being a a stream processing engine why wouldn't you use storm why wouldn't you use uh, kafka streams or uh, you know your favorite stream processing engine um, i think that you know the the answer is Simplicity. Uh, first, this addresses the ops crowd, not uh, uh, software engineers. You you want something that's you know well contained for your um, uh, for your monitoring most of the time. Uh, it's a very fast single host solution. Uh, its its persistence is in memory only, uh, and so this might sound like uh, bad compromises to make, but. Uh, they are the ones who, uh, which enable um, re really fast performance and, and a lot of flexibility in the in the tool. And um, I'm, I'm, I won't be addressing that today, but scaling is still possible uh, beyond one node with uh, Riemann, uh, given a few uh, a few tricks. So we'll now look at what configuration uh, looks like, uh, because that's the you know the heart of the the talk. Um, there are only two concepts uh, for the configuration. Um, your task is to build streams. Uh, streams are a function of events uh, that will be called for uh, every event that comes in. Um, and that's about it. So if we, if we look at the simple config, um, as I was uh, saying, there, there are you know, facilities to set up logging uh, uh, inputs. Here we just start a TCP server and then janitorial work. Uh, here we have a thread that expires uh, all the events every, every minute. Uh, and then we can uh, define the uh, store, which is one of these in-memory um, indices, um, a, a way to email out. Um, and then we have our stream, which um, you know, uh, we'll look at um, in, in detail at how configuration uh, works. Uh, but I think the key points uh, and what we really focus our efforts on are um, 
UI, and when I say UI, I mean programming UI, not uh, uh, visualization. Um, because, you know, Clojure itself is very good at dealing with data uh, and at building data abstractions. Uh, and you could think that if you wanted to um, filter on a specific service and metric, and in that case apply a new key to um, every incoming event, uh, you could just write a transducer, for instance. Uh, Clojure has that uh, internal capacity now. Um, but if, if this is what you give to your uh, ops team, they're not going to use your... Uh, they're not going to use your thing, right? Uh, whereas, um, even though it's still a bit of a hard sell <laughs> for operations teams, uh, having a, a simpler language, uh, something that uh, you know, is closer to what you would be uh, doing in English, uh, already goes a, a long way. Uh, and so that's what we focused on doing. Uh, I'll, now, I'll now show you a few select use cases uh, of you know, the type of um, um, functions uh, you, you get to deal with in Riemann. Um, these great illustrations are from um, uh, Carl Kingsbury, who was uh, the original author of uh, Riemann. They're not from me. Um, here, again, uh, filtering on the specific events and applying functions only to these specific events. Um, is is quite simple. Uh, you you write your uh, where query, and er anything that's c that's closed over by the where query um, only is applicated to these events. Um, if we look at um, you know building substreams out of a main stream, so if you look at you know your incoming stream of events as one huge river, uh, you might separate this river uh, by a predicate. Uh, here we say that we want to create a substream for every um, host and service tuple. Um, and then uh, within that substream, uh, we, we, we hold on to events, right? We, we, we keep uh, the last version of an event, and what we're going to look at is, did it change? Uh, did, did the state key within that event change? If so, uh, I'll take an action. Um, and with these three lines, you've built something that you know uh, watches over your incoming stream, and every time something goes from OK to critical, then you're going to be sending an email. Um, but if you have state transitions that happen every uh, every second, you might not want to send an email every every second because your ops team is going to figure out that something is wrong uh, at the first one. Uh, so rollup allows you to avoid um, sending too many transitions by holding on to events for a window of time and only applicating the the function when uh, when the time window has expired. You can also rewrite uh, to adapt and modify Mangle with events. Uh, you have uh, grouping and folding uh, options. Since I have uh, uh, only 10 minutes left, I'll go a bit faster on, uh, on that. Uh, since you're dealing with metrics, uh, uh, we also have small functions that help you deal with, am I within a threshold, a known threshold for, uh, for events? And if so, apply actions only for those that uh, fit or do not fit within that threshold. So again, by, um, by normalizing on the specific input type, uh, something that standard stream processing engines w wouldn't do, we're able to provide functions that you know, make the, the standard use cases very easy to build. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, this goes to show there, there was an article um, uh, posted on Storm, uh, using Storm uh, to compute uh, Twitter trends. Uh, and I took that as an exercise to uh, to build the same thing in Riemann, and it comes down to uh, these uh, four simple lines. Uh, and, and that exact recipe can be used to watch over your infrastructure and notify if there are outliers, for instance. Uh, if you have uh, one of your uh, front-end servers that has a higher number of uh, 400 class errors, uh, these are the type of constructs that are going to help you pick them out very quickly. All right, um, a quick look under the hood and how you build uh, a nice programming UI uh, and expose that. Uh, and the answer is, um, since it's uh, a Lisp, a lot of macros uh, and um, a bit of uh, using Clojure's STM uh, for a mutable state. Um, so 
to use Clojure as a configuration language, there really isn't much that you need to do. Uh, the only thing is that you have to load um, a namespace uh, and then load a file uh, to execute within the namespace. It's then up to you to provide functions in that namespace that help uh, build um, the, the use cases that uh, I showed you. And as far and as far as the the, the functions uh, are actually concerned, if we look at a standard uh, stream where uh, we have these uh, uh, these four function these three functions that get uh, uh, called, uh, and this one were a single one, uh, streams is additive. So any any time you call it, um, uh, new streams are added onto the list. So here we need to mutate state a little bit. For this, uh, we use. Clojure's STM, and in that specific case, atoms uh, to just uh, conj uh, onto the list of streams the, the new ones that were given to us. Uh, so again, we have very simple tooling to provide uh, a UI that, uh, that feels natural to, um, um, to consumers of your products. Um, if we look a little bit more at internals, uh, I'll describe how we can go about uh, writing such clo closures. Uh, here we want to close over any uh, event that is tagged with uh, should print or debug, and in that case, actually print it out, right? Uh, PRN is just a function of anything that prints it out. So first, we, we can write um, a small predicate that looks at uh, tags and ensures that uh, any of the tags actually appear in the event. Uh, and then here, we can write that closure, which uh, takes the tags as arguments and use, uses them in the, in the closure uh, by executing uh, children only if the predicate is true. Uh, and in that case, we use call rescue. Um, which is a macro. I'll, I'll do a way for those who don't know macro about uh, explaining uh, why all the sigils. Uh, but the idea of a macro, as you know, is to have a function that actually writes code at compile time. So anytime we call call rescue, uh, we expand to that do sec uh, code, which just tries to call uh, all children function on the event uh, and uh, you know, report any failure, any exceptions that was raised uh, in the process. I'll, um, yeah, great, five minutes. Uh, I'll wrap it up with Coalice. Uh, that brings these two things together. I showed you uh, mutable state uh, and then the closures. Uh, we use um, Coalice as a way to, um, as I was demoing here, um, holds on to all events uh, over time, and then any time a new event comes in, calls the children function with the list of events. So here, every time we get uh, we call this, we can uh, map uh, a sum of all the metrics in the events, and then do something with the, the output. And here for Coalice, uh, we, we build a closure, uh, we build an atom uh, that will store uh, any incoming event. Uh, and we use that, um, that atom we created within the closure by uh, swapping uh, onto it uh, and adding new events. Uh, and then we can, we can just call our, uh, our call rescue that uh, we built earlier, uh, and that's it. This is you know, really simplified. Um, it, the actual Riemann code is a little bit more uh, complex and deals with expiring events and things like this, but this is the general idea and the tooling that we have. So to wrap up, um, I think Clojure is, is a great tool for building uh, pro programmatic UIs. Uh, macros and the STM allow you to build really solid uh, functionality. Everything that we build here is thread safe. Uh, and since Netty spans you know, several um, worker threads for actually executing things that come onto the, the network, uh, this functionality is really useful. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Um, plenty of people are now relying on Riemann. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to, um, quote, uh, to quote them, but uh, we know of uh, plenty of um, telco operators that, uh, that rely on it too to uh, process a huge amount of, uh, of events. And that's about it. I'll be taking questions. Thank you.
wonderful talk. Um, Thank you. You got pretty uh, like nice uh, DSL for developers to write configuration of Riven. And uh, since it's closure, so it's also a data, do you have an idea to build a graphical interface which will allow you to combine the same rules on a graphical user interface, which will export?